Okay, well, it is great to be in the neighborhood, as Mr. Rogers says. As you know, we should pray welcome to our, our neighborhood each time. Um, I also want to welcome our FaceTime Live friends. I know some of them were on praying with us. I did post on FaceTime Live that we would, or my Facebook page yesterday, that we were going to pray together. So hopefully people joined us if you weren't able to join us and you're on FaceTime Live. We're going to pray again for this virus. Only we're going to thank God that he heard our prayer for this morning. Um, tonight um, in our 7 o'clock group gather, so we'll pray at a quarter to 7. So you're looking beautiful as always, <laughs> especially after you sing, you look really good then. Some of us come in like we just came in from a little bit of a problem, but after we're done singing, he gives us that facelift, we look really good, amen? It is so great to be here. If you did miss the prayer time this morning, I will tell you, it's it was a powerful time, and you know, this is what the church has to do. We need to rise up, because you know what happens? We start thinking without thinking about what we're thinking about. Well, you know, these things have to run their course. Where did that come from? See, that's one of those religious spirits that get on us, because we, well, you know, we live in a fallen world. But that's not what the Word says. The Word says, no evil shall befall you. It says, no pestilence shall come nigh your dwelling place. It says, I'll send my word and deliver you from your destructions. But we fall for that deception and the lie, and it comes from the very place where this coronavirus was sent from, Amen. hell itself, that you know, it will run its course and, you know, we just Lord be with the people who go through this. And we have to take authority over these things because God has given, behold, I give you authority and power over all of the power of the enemy, and nothing shall by any means harm you. That's a really Amen. exceptional faith statement. Amen. Well, I serve an exceptional God. Amen. 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 We've got to believe these things. And right <coughs> and you know what? I want you to confess for the rest of the day. This prayer is working. It's already bringing this thing down. The reports we hear is it's going to get gooder and gooder. And people are going to be moved into Jesus' arms. He'll use things. He's not the author of them. But he'll sure use the enemy. Amen? So I want you to believe all of that. So yesterday during actually my prayer time, I just heard the Lord say, tomorrow when you gather, take authority over that curse. Because that's what it is. It's a curse. It is not of God. And last I checked, Jesus became a curse. So if he became a curse, guess what curse he took? Before we ever gave this thing a name, he already was there and saw it and Word. Amen? Amen. I'm going to jump right into the word today. Are you ready to be empowered today? Yes. And have your faith stirred because I am fired up because the devil is a liar and Jesus is Messiah. Amen? So why don't you turn to Luke 4 before I keep having a holy fit up here. Amen. Amen. Okay. I would like you to stand one time. I'm going to read to you. I wasn't planning on this, but I'm keeping with our message today. We don't need to do that. Hear the word of the Lord. The Spirit of the Lord is upon me, because he has anointed me to preach the gospel to the poor. He has sent me to heal the brokenhearted, to preach deliverance to the captives and recovery of sight to the blind, to set at liberty those who are oppressed, and to preach the acceptable year of the Lord. That is exactly what this meeting is about today, and it's exactly what we read during our prayer time today. Father... As we open up your word now, just as we sang that song, let your glory fall and let our hearts be open to receive all that you would have us to know today. God, we thank you for the corporate anointing that's yes. rushing through this place, yes. that heaven is blowing upon each and every one of us to set every captive free, to answer every question, to answer every prayer. Lord God, I pray not only for a corporate anointing that we would all be unified and more like you together, yes. but also, Lord, for the individuals that are here. Father, I pray that you would give them a rhema word today, yes. one that answers a question they have, one that they can build their faith upon and increase their faith in. Yes. We thank you for the healing, delivering, saving power of Jesus Christ today. I hide behind and in the secret place of the Most High, so we can say of the Lord, He is our refuge and our God in whom we trust. And all the women in this place said, Amen. Amen. You may be seated. I have exactly 30 minutes. This is going to be an all time record. This is going to be an all time record. So I'm going to talk fast. I should just skip all the message in tongues. I'll have power. 
come up and interpret it, because I know it'll make her long. Anyway, last week we opened to chapter four, if you remember, in the book of Luke. By the way, those of you are visiting, so happy to see you. Great to see you. Great to see Teresa, or was it Elisa? Elisa. Elisa. Okay, really nice to have you. Um, we opened up to chapter four. We read about and learned about, and we were impacted by the anatomy of temptation. The anatomy of temptation. Why? Because Jesus, as he was baptized by John in the Jordan, and we know that the that the heavens opened up as he prayed at his baptism, and the heavens opened up and, and the Spirit of God like a dove rested upon him, and the Father stood yeah. and said, What? This is my beloved Son in whom I am well pleased. And the Spirit of God led him into the wilderness. We talked about wilderness. We talked about what happened when he went there. I mean, talked about the fact that, you know, sometimes we want promotion, but sometimes, you, most of the time, or back all the time, I'm just going to be bold and say, you're ready to go into the wilderness before you go into the promotion. Because the Son of God himself went into a time of, of literal mocking and being attacked by Satan himself in preparation. You know, when we come up deeper, a building, a skyscraper that's, you know, hundreds of feet tall means the foundation has to be deeper. The taller it goes, the deeper the foundation has to be. And so we learned that Jesus was led by the Spirit. He didn't accidentally find himself attacked by the devil. He was led by the Spirit of God into the wilderness at a place called the Mount of Temptation down by the Dead Sea in the wilderness area where Satan, for 40 days while he fasted, he just literally attacked him. And he didn't just use na 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 He used the words. He actually tempted him to do things against the will of God, and he used the word to do it. We learned, I'm not going to repeat that message, we learned that the way Satan tempted Jesus in the wilderness has not changed in all these years. He uses the same tactics. <coughs> Touch your neighbor and say he ain't got nothing new. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> nothing. It's the same old devil with the same old tricks. And what did he do? He tempted him by 1 John 2, which we learned last week, the lust of the eye, the lust of the flesh, and the pride of life. This is how they were tempted in the garden, and it's been the same temptation all the way through. So we need to be ready and know when our flesh is desirous to think maybe God isn't or it's not our time. You know, even being out of God's timing can be out of his will. So we've learned that, that he used that tactic and the word against Jesus. It's what he used on him, and as I said, he ain't got nothing else. And the word, he even twisted the word. We found out last week that he twisted the word and that he left some of the word out. You know, the Lord said in the book of Revelation to anyone who adds to this word yeah. or takes it, the plagues of that is written thereon will come upon him. And how many know one of these days yeah. that the God of this world is going to be captivated and held down for all eternity? Yeah. Well, we enjoy all eternity. Yeah. Amen? Yeah. Jesus, at some point, we realize, sat down with the disciples, his future church. Okay, He sat down with them and not only explained this episode that we talked about last week, but he shared with them the way he was victorious and the way we can be victorious too. By what? By knowing, declaring, and trusting God. Knowing the word and declaring the word. It's not enough to know the word. You've got to speak the word. You've got to say the word. Why? Because life and death is in the power of our tongue. When we speak the word, it's like a two-edged sword. We see that in the life of Christ. When he comes on that white horse, he pulls a sword out of his what? Yeah. Not out of his head. No, not out of his thinking. He pulls it out of his mouth. We, we speak the word. Things happen. The word of faith is in you. Yes, the word that we speak. Even in Romans, it says that. And so Jesus explained that to them. And they were the future church. And guess what? It's the same way today. We defeat the devil the same exact way. And for 40 days, he endured the constant onslaught of Satan's attacks. But Jesus did not come out of that time weak. He did not come at that time beat up. Let's see how he came out of a season in his life. Some of you may be going for a season like that. You may feel you're in the wilderness and that you're dealing with an onslaught of, of his attacks. How did Jesus handle that once he settled himself in the word, declaring the word, 
taken authority in the word. Verse 14 and 15 is where we'll begin. And Jesus returned in the power of the Spirit to Galilee. He didn't return weak and, and had a pity party and, and asked everybody, oh, I'm just getting so beat up and, you know, poor me and what was me. You know, I'm just so downtrodden. No, because Jesus handled what he had it was more victorious than anything the devil could ever throw his way. Amen. Can I tell you, that is a word for every single one of us today. If you will not fight your spiritual battles in the flesh, if you'll fight them in the spirit, why? Because 2 Corinthians says, my weapons are not carnal. They're not fleshy. They're not of this world, but they're mighty to the bringing down of every single stronghold. So if we get in the spirit and we let the spirit rule and reign and lead us, we won't be pitiful and weak and broken down. We'll be strong and we'll go into wherever he calls us, in this case Galilee, in the power of the Holy Spirit. You know, when you speak the word, when that word is in you and, and you're, you're processing it and transitioning it out of your spirit, out of your mouth, Guess what? That anointing is not only doing something as you speak it to the thing you speak it to. What does Isaiah 54 say? My word will not return void, but it will prosper in the thing that I sent it. Well, guess what? As it comes out of you, you and me change too. Because that anointing is going through this vessel of you, you and, and myself, and we're changed too. And that's what gives us the strength to do what we need to do. Because it's not our strength. What was the word Anna gave? Well, that's right. Not by might, not by power, but by my spirit, saith the Lord. Amen? So he come into Galilee with power and spirit, and the news of him went out through all the surrounding region. Well, we're, the word's a little silent here. Again, we talked about um, your, your parallel study Bibles that have other input to some of this. Um, we don't he absolutely knew he was teaching along the way. He left from the southern end of Israel or the Judean wilderness area to get up to Galilee. There were cities and places along the way that where he stopped. But we read here that the news about him went out. So therefore, he was preaching. He was ministering along the way for the news to be <coughs> spread out. And he taught in their synagogues being glorified by all. Let's look at that. Jesus came out with power because what? Because he didn't endure the hardship of Satan again in the flesh. Okay? He came out in the power of the Spirit. Boy, I think that's a, a word for us to take hold of right here and now today. I'd like to repeat something powerful, however, that I taught you last week. That I believe he taught his disciples. They got this. And I hope these disciples here get it too. And what is that? Remember, at the close of the service, we said, I believe Jesus was saying to Satan without saying it, and certainly told his disciples, I don't need to be in my deity to be Satan. Amen. I don't need to be in my deity to have victory over Satan. That's right. You know what, church? What he's saying here? I did it in spirit and in truth. Amen. And you know what? That's why the Father's looking for worshipers. Amen. Because when we do things like that, we take this devil down and we attack the problems that come into our life in spirit and truth. That's worship. That's worship. Worship is singing a song, but it's so much more than singing a song. Worship's every single day of our life and how we handle problems and situations and attacks that come our way. Amen? Amen. Who do we put our focus on is who the worship goes to. Amen? Amen. And that's exactly what he was saying. So he, his teaching ministry is now officially beginning, I guess you could say. His preparation is over. He's been baptized. He went into the wilderness. That was all preparation. So now his teaching ministry and his hands-on ministry will, will begin. And it says he went into the synagogues. Synagogues, very interesting word. It comes from the Hebrew word, okay, bet ha -kines. bet ha -kineset. bet ha -kineset. which means bet always means house. It's the Hebrew letter that means house. So it's house of assembly. It's simply a house of assembly. Now, it's not the temple. Synagogues would be all over the place. 
Every city he would go to, there would be a synagogue. To this day, mm -hmm. in every town you go to, there's a synagogue. Mm -hmm. Probably several. They're extensions of the temple, and yet they're not the temple because the temple was the place where sacrificial worship was given. In the synagogues, that did not take place. In order to have a synagogue, you need 10 men to have that, okay? When we, you go to Israel with us, we only go, El Al, I've never traveled any of it. That's the, the only Jewish airline there is. And when you're on that trip, we always leave later in the afternoon or in the evening. So there's an early morning rising. And you will see there are men that gather with their prayer shawls when they begin to start praising the Lord. Synagogues were only just for teaching. They're for singing. They're for assembling together and reading scripture and prayer. And you will see that right on the plane. They just start gathering and they start singing. One time we were in the airport ready to come back and they gathered and they just had themselves a real party right in the airport. Singing, you know, the Hava Ganelia and all of this and something, you know? So... Again, you need 10 to do that. And that's exactly what they did. I'm losing my track here. Um, they're in every city. In fact, they're all over the world. There will be synagogues that we'll see. Well, so far, so good for Jesus, right? Everybody's happy. He's happy. He's teaching. They're listening. Uh, but unfortunately, it's going to come to a preaching, screeching halt. And not before we even get out of chapter 4 will we see that. Verse 16. He came to Nazareth, or even brought up. Oh, he just puts that in there. And as his custom was, he went into the synagogue on the Sabbath day. Well, I can't help but resist, and I, I won't beat you up too much about it. But I hope that's your custom, too. Amen. Yeah. I hope it's your custom that every again you show up to worship the Lord. See, Jesus was brought up in a home where... Every week, you know, don't 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 throw any kind of bananas or, or a grapefruit at me. But he didn't let soccer get in the way. Amen. See, Jesus' soccer game had to not interfere yeah. with going Amen. to the synagogue. Amen. Listen, the devil will use anything. Oh, yeah. It can look good, but is it best? Yes. Doesn't mean it's bad. It's just at the expense of best. Yeah. Amen. Yeah. And we wonder why. We have a generation who don't really see church all that important. Yeah. Why? Because probably in our years of growing up, our generation of children, all these activities just get in the way. And we just think it's, a, and quite frankly, there was a time I know with my children, there was an avoidance of Sunday. But I could see as the fourth one came along, that was changing. That was changing. You know, it used to be, as you know, there wasn't even stores open on Sundays. All this has changed so people can be too busy to go to church. So I just say, I pray that's our custom. Because that's following Christ. It was his custom. He went to that synagogue, and look what it says. He stood up to read. So here he is, Jesus in his hometown, Nazareth. Now, I'm sure he couldn't wait to get there. You know, I like to take us into the personal walk with the Lord and the personal characters that we're studying to really put ourselves in that place. Listen, he was growing up here. This is where he played soccer with his friends here. This is where he played baseball. You know, that's why he wrote in the beginning. Right? He played baseball there. Right. So, yeah, this is where his family was, where he grew up. It's where that good bagel and locks place was on the corner that you could smell, you know, every single morning. So the first thing he does is before he does anything, is he goes into the synagogues and he teaches. He teaches. Verse 17 through 19. And he was handed the book of the prophet Isaiah. And when he had opened the book, he found the place where it's written, the spirit of the Lord is upon me because he's anointed me to preach the gospel to the poor. He sent me to heal the brokenhearted, to proclaim liberty to the captives. We read this. Victory, uh, recovery of sight to the blind, to set at liberty those who are oppressed, to proclaim the acceptable year of the Lord. Now take notice with me. Take notice with me. Um, what is the punctuation sign that we see in verse 19? It says, where is it, 19? To proclaim the acceptable year of the Lord. To set at liberty those who were oppressed. Comma. Do you see these commas? Okay. Are, are you with me with that? So he. It's not a period. It's a comma. 
And you know what? You know, commas matter. Yeah. Do you know that commas matter? If you say, I want to eat, comma, grandpa, or I just want to eat grandpa. <laughs> commas matter. Punctuation matters. Yeah. And we read here, let's see it in the spirit of the Lord's upon me. He's, pre he's called me to preach the good news to the poor, sent me to heal the brokenhearted, to proclaim liberty to the captives and recovery to the sight, to set at liberty those that were oppressed, and to proclaim the acceptable year of the Lord. And in another version, it says the vengeance of the Lord. Okay? Vengeance of the Lord would be. Bring up verse 20, Marge. I think I should have given you that with it. I think you have it together with 20 and 21. So you can look at it. So 20. So yeah. So it says um, to bring recovery to bring recovery to the site, right? And to preach the acceptable year of the Lord. The vengeance. That's that's a, that's a comma. Or that's the period, I should say. Okay, let's go back now. I'm getting confused myself here now. So that means he was quoting from another place is what I'm getting at. We know he's quoting from Isaiah because the word tells us he's quoting from Isaiah. Are you with me? So Jesus is quoting from And it says that, we know that because it says that he, he read from the place where it is found. And again, Luke tells us it is Luke. That means he's quoting from Luke. And there's commas in there, okay? Now, you might say, well, what is the big deal, whether it's a comma or a period, or what does it matter? Well, the original passage that Jesus was quoting was from Isaiah 61, okay? And it originally reads like this, Isaiah 61, verse 2, okay? To proclaim the acceptable year of the Lord, okay? Comma, right? And the day of vengeance of our God to comfort who who mourn. Okay, now, Marge, can we go back to 19? Did you see that there's a comma after the vengeance of our God? But here, to proclaim the acceptable year of the Lord is a period. So it's the same thing he's saying, but there's a period in Luke, but there's a comma in Isaiah. Are you with me? You're probably thinking, is this an English lesson or is this a Bible lesson? Well, it's, it's a little bit of both, okay? So let's look at verse 20 and 21. It says, then he closed the book. Well, that's interesting. Yeah. So he's got a period at this is the acceptable year of the Lord. He doesn't go on like Isaiah doesn't say, and the vengeance of our God to yeah. comfort all those that mourn. It closes the book. He didn't finish it. And he gave it back to the attendant, and he sat down. And the eyes of all who were in the synagogue were fixed on him. And he began to say to them, today. This scripture has been fulfilled in Amen. your midst. Now, I know a lot of you have read this before. I know a lot of you know it before. But what I want you to see is he deliberately ended here. A period does mean the end, doesn't it? Yeah. Of a thought. In other words, he turned, he turned the comma in Isaiah to a period in Luke and closed the scroll. He didn't finish the original passage found in Isaiah 50, 61 on purpose. It wasn't, oh, whoops, there's one of those contradictions. No, it was on purpose. He, what he, he, what he read, yeah. mm. and what he read, he said, today, this is fulfilled in your hearing. Amen. So he put a period yeah. instead of a comma and said, today, this has been fulfilled in your hearing. What was he saying? I'm the Messiah. Amen. I'm the Messiah, and many of you know that. If you were a Jew in that day and you were sitting in that synagogue when that happened, you would be protesting in your mind what took place. Why? Because not only is he proclaiming to be the Messiah, but he also they would be thinking to themselves, well, wait a minute, you left out that vengeance thing. You know, where, you, where the Messiah comes and gets our enemies and comforts Zion and makes us all feel better. You forgot that. See, Messiah is supposed to get back to our enemies and comfort all that. And Jesus, you left that out. So how could you really be the Messiah? See, my family, because he left out the comma, he could say, today the scripture is fulfilled in your midst. Just keep hanging with me, okay? Take note. If he, if he would, would have continued on, 
He could not have sat down and said, today this has been fulfilled in your midst. Do you know why? Would you like to know why? Yeah. I'm so glad you asked why. The reason is Jesus closed the book and turned the comma into a period is because of this. He would come twice. He would come twice. Okay? Messiah, yes, came according to the prophesied scriptures, but he would leave and he would come again. Are, are you with me? So it's not one coming, but it's two comings. And that's why there is a gap. That's why there's a comma after the first coming and before the second coming. Exactness and integrity of God's word rocks my world to no end. How many would even pick this up, really? So Jesus came to the earth, comma, and Jesus will return again. And when he does, he will fulfill the second part. Okay, the vengeance of our God and the comfort of all those that mourn in Zion. The tribulation period. When that tribulation period is over, Jesus is going to save Israel. All of Israel will be saved. He will rise them up or raise them up in those last days. But until then, we have what we call the church age. Okay? And that time has lasted 2,000 plus years. Okay? Are you with me? We are living, church, in Isaiah's comma. We're living in Isaiah's comma, which is, Marge will be happy to know the title of today's message. Isaiah's comma, because she's asked me in three days and I don't give it to her. I sure hope you, really, I sure hope you are as happy as I am. I sure hope that you are as happy as I am, because I got saved during that comma. Amen. You got saved during that comma. We all got saved during that comma. That comment is the age of grace, the dispensation of grace that we find ourselves in. But guess what? We can't get comfortable living in the comma because one day the comma will be over. And, Bill, and that period in human history is going to come, the second coming of Christ. When he comes, that comma will be, would you say with me, a period. When he comes, the judgment throne of God Almighty is coming, and it won't be a come, it'll be a period. That's right. But until then, until then, we live in Isaiah's comma. That's exactly where we're living. And it's still the acceptable year of the Lord sent to the poor, the sick, the brokenhearted. And so Jesus could say, Today, this has been fulfilled in your midst. Why? Why could he do that? Because he had filled that first part. The vengeance of our God and the comforting of all that morning Zion isn't going to come till the second coming. So he didn't just miss out some of Isaiah 61. He fulfilled the portion in that day and time that he was the fulfiller of. Amen? Amen? So Jesus said, today, this has been fulfilled. The, the, the procedure in the temple, I find this to be so interesting. The procedure in the synagogue was this, and that's why I had you do this this morning, and we often do. There was a standing for the reading of the word. When the word was done being read, everybody would be seated, including the speaker. <coughs> including the speaker, okay? And I just love Jesus, and then he would expound upon the scripture that was just read. Like, us that take 45 minutes to an hour most Tuesdays. Jesus sat down, handed the book over, very procedural in, in a synagogue. Everybody sat, he sat, and he had a one-sentence sermon. Oh. <laughs> Today, this has been fulfilled in your midst. He could not have said any less, and we could have not gotten any more out of anything. I love that, because you know what? He didn't give 10 steps to freedom. Um, he didn't give 15 steps on how the blind can sit. You know what he said? If you just look at me. Amen. If your focus is just on me. If you find out who I am. You know that song he said, Knowing Jesus. There is no greater thing. It's not knowing the five part series on whatever. If we just know him. There is no greater thing. It's all we have to know. If we study Jesus, 
you know, on Sundays we're, we're studying Psalm 23. And we're spending a lot of time looking at the Lord is my shepherd. I have no lack. See, David wrote that from the perspective of a sheep. Even though he was a shepherd, he's writing it as a sheep. And we're learning that the that in six verses, the first one tells us about the shepherd. The rest of it tell us when you really know who the shepherd is, when you know who he is and that you're a sheep in his pasture, these are all the things that take place. Amen. This is very similar to what is being said here in Isaiah 61, is if you just know him. If you just know he's Messiah, and then you find out what the anointing of Messiah is, there's no more questions needed, okay? None. Verse 22 says this. So all four witnessed to him and marveled at his gracious words which proceeded out of his mouth. And they said, is this not Joseph's son? I want to stop here, and I want us, perfect timing, I want us to marvel like they did then. I want us to stop here when we get into our groups, and I want us to continue marveling exactly where they marveled. So we're going to talk in our group time about these kind of things. Um, I'm going to read to you, if you have this, if you all got yep. one when you came in, if you didn't let us know, we'll get it to you. But here's, here's the point. If you take together as your group time, Luke 4, verses 18 and 19, Read it. Read it out loud. That will be the third time we've heard it. And then bring your notes back next week to class. But use the notes I gave you for today. And together, talk about, based on the scripture in Luke 4, 18 to 19, what are the characteristics of the Messianic anointing? If they tell us right there what they are. Okay? Then, before you go today, I want somebody in the group to turn over to Hebrews 13, 8. And read that out loud and discuss if we know the messianic appointment, messianic anointing, what does Hebrews tell us about how that should impact our personal lives each and every single day? Amen? Amen. But before we do that, before we do that, um, I just want to bring to your attention something. I, I know you already know because Jeanette sent this out to the facilitators, but Deanna, I want you to come up here for a second. She's like, oh, no. <laughs> you all make that cute smile, but I know what you're thinking. <laughs> Come on up. So this is Deanna. Now you know her, right? She's been with us for quite a while. And she, um, she very much inspires me, I have to tell you, because it's just really wonderful when you get to see somebody, no matter what their age is, but when you see them come to Christ, And realize, you know, that we've done things wrong. We all have. And you come to Christ and you know he's the only answer. Amen. And that he only Amen. took those things and he made them right. And because of that, we walk in righteousness. Amen. And so, you know, seeing her walk through that and she was baptized in our very own swimming pool and just watching her come week after week and just, just watching her grow has just blessed me. It just really has. So there's Something really special about watching somebody from the beginning of their Christ formation and watching him become bigger and greater and and, and making him known. Um, so, you know, one of these days I think she's going to share with you. I don't even know all of her stories. Some of us don't know any of each other's stories. But she has really worked through some things with the Lord and he has graced her in her journey with him. And um, to the point that she's got her own place now, right? And, um, yeah. and, um, and, um, and not just that, but he just worked it out, right? You told me, or I think Michelle too, that, you know, getting to work and getting things to, well, God provided the place for her to live that she can walk to work. He just caused every single thing to work together for good. And it's just a blessing to watch, and it's just a blessing for all of us to to share your joy in the Lord. And I just pray that all the days of your life that you would just follow him because yeah. he'll always take you to greener pastures. Yeah. Amen. So we have a little little gift for you um, for your new home, a little housewarming and some little word encouragements in there. But I do want to pray for her. Why don't we stand and uh, extend your hand forward. We'll pray for her and then we'll let you go to sleep. 
Lord God, we come into your presence this day. And Father, I just thank you that that song is just, there's no, there's no better thing than knowing you. All this world has to offer, all that seems the way, easy way out, you are our joy. It's not even something you give us, it's you are our joy. And so we just, we just touch Deanna with our words, with our heart. We just, we just lift her up to you. We thank you for the encouragement she has brought us being here. I, I pray, God, that just as Jesus grew in stature and the ammunition of the Lord, I pray that for her. Lord, we just cancel any residue, Lord, from the old life. I pray it have no, it would have no uh, hindrance to her whatsoever. Lord, you cause us to triumph in every single way. And I pray, God, that she would, in this home that she's in, that, Lord, she'd be a lighthouse in that place. I pray that she would not just know you, but you, she, you would use her to make you known. And we just pray a blessing to overtake her. We cancel every curse. We speak every blessing. We plead the blood of Jesus over every doorpost and lentil in that place. Devil, you have no right. You, you have no you have no ability to trespass on God's property. And we just thank you that the blood speaks. And every time you try to have an entrance there through a person, a scenario, or the past that that blood will speak, saved, delivered, forgiven, healed, and blessed. Amen. And I just thank you for who she is, and that the best is yet to come. Amen. 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 Okay, so we're going to dismiss in a few minutes. And um, we just want to say happy birthday thank to you. you.